Great little review of the story of the Exodus. If you haven't read the story of Moses lately, it's, it's big. You should read it. Uh, pick up the book of Exodus um, and read the story of Moses. Now, for those of you who are just joining us, haven't been with us the last couple of weeks, we've been working our way following a thread that goes all the way through the scriptures. Instead of being isolated little stories we talk about each week, we want to see what is the big story. Uh, and it's a story about God's love, God that will not let us go. A God who comes to redeem us because of the brokenness, um, our disobedience um, way back in the garden. Uh, and, and this promise uh, is carried with a promise. And the promise was first given to this guy named Abraham, right? Passed on from generation to generation. Last week we talked about how the promise was passed down to Abraham's great-grandson, a guy named Joseph. How when even Joseph's brothers meant things for evil, God was able to take that and use it for good. Um, it was carried with them as they sojourned, as they went down to live in Egypt, where jo Joseph was a mighty ruler. And, but continued, the promise continued, even after Joseph wasn't ruler anymore. And his people were made slaves, and for 400 years they cried out for a deliverer to save them. And God raised up Moses, this unlikely, reluctant leader who didn't want to do it, who spoke through his brother Aaron to do mighty signs and wonders, who demanded Pharaoh, let my people go. Eventually he did, um, after all those plagues. Well, for, the, for the people of Israel, this was the fulfillment of a promise that had been made generations ago. Freedom for them. They were able to go now to this land that God had promised them. An event of God's deliverance was so important that they used this date to measure their time. And we have a timeline up on the wall there. And when we measure time, oftentimes we'll use the, the event of Jesus to say before Christ or A.D., year of our Lord, Anno Domini. Uh, and we say the Jesus event is that important uh, the event for us, that we're, how we measure time, either after or before this. For the Jewish people, here's where they mark their time. This is the beginning. It was either before the Exodus or after the Exodus. That's how they measured their time. This was, the Exodus was the event where God intervened in history and made them their people and created it from them. And so that for them, that's, they say, this is where we start measuring time for us. So let me turn and read to Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This month is to be the first month of the year for you. Tell the people of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, the head of each household must choose a lamb or a young goat for his family to eat. If the family is too small to eat a whole animal, they must share it with their next-door neighbors. You choose either a sheep or a goat, but it must be a year-old male with nothing wrong with it. It must be large enough for everyone to have some of the meat. Each family must take care of its animal until evening on the 14th day of the month when the animals are to be killed. Some of the blood must be put on the doorposts above the door of each house where the animals are to be eaten. That night the animals are to be roasted and eaten together with bitter herbs and thin bread made without yeast. Don't eat the meat raw or boiled. The entire animal, including its head and legs and insides, must be roasted. Yuck. All right. Eat whatever you want that night. The next morning burn whatever is left. It doesn't say yuck in there. I just added that. It's just <laughs> When you eat the meal, uh, be dressed, be ready for travel. Have your sandals on, your walking stick in your hand. Eat quickly. The Passover festival is in honor of me, your Lord. That same night I will pass through Egypt and kill the firstborn son of every family, the firstborn male of all animals. I am the Lord. I will punish the gods of Egypt the blood on the houses will show me where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Then you won't be bothered by the terrible disaster that I bring upon Egypt. All right. For us, the idea of sacrificing an animal is just plain bizarre, strange. And putting its blood on our house, even weirder. I mean, you, we would not do that. We'd be arrested <laughs> if we did that, all right? Um, but blood was a, uh, was a symbol of life. I mean, there's no life without blood. Uh, and so that's why that was part of the offerings that they would make. That is saying the most precious thing we have is life. And the blood represented the most precious thing they had, life. A thousand years later, Jesus is going to take this tradition that they've been doing for a millennia uh, and, and do something new with it. My thing's not working here. Can we borrow your other remote there for a second? 
They're not, all right, nothing's working. There he goes, all right. A thousand years later, Jesus um, says the same thing. He says, I'm going to take this uh, and give new meaning to this. Blood still means life. But he says, this blood is going to remind you of my life for you to save and deliver you. Just as the blood of the lamb once saved you, I will save uh, all humankind. A few weeks uh, ago, we talked about how the stars were given to, to Abraham as this tangible reminder. And so Abraham could go out any night, look up and see stars and remember God's promise for him. The descendants of Abraham for generations could look at this sign and do that. They were given another remembrance as well, another sign to help them remember the promise, and that was this meal that they were to do every year to remember this Passover. Uh, it would be tied to food that they would have, and so that would help remind them they would have a special meal they could look forward to, special dishes they only ate that time of year, tangible, physical reminder of God's promise for them. Jesus renews the promise as he gathers with his disciples to celebrate Passover and tells them, uh, it's not just about remembering the past, it's about a future where life will triumph over death. This brokenness of creation will be redeemed. But it doesn't happen yet, right? He says we still have to wait. We struggle for now. Bad things still happen to good people. Illness and death rob us of the joy of living. Sometimes it takes all of our energy just to get through the day. And injustices seem to prevail way too often. And we, we call out, uh, like the people of Israel who were slaves and say, God, where are you? Uh, what's going on? I thought you promised to always be there for us. God gives us a sign to remind us that even during these difficult times, God's promise still holds. And God takes something ordinary like food, like bread and wine, stuff we encounter every day, and gives it new meaning, reminding us that nothing can separate us from God's love. There's a light that shines in the darkness. We can find forgiveness fresh starts, new beginnings. The lost can be found. Karen, why don't you give me a little, uh, um, uh, here is bread. And then Ben, why don't you guys make your, start making your way back up here. We're going to be talking about sharing bread, sharing wine. And Jesus reminds us that food is not just for the stomach, right? It's his body given for us to nourish strengthen our spirits the same way that the bread we eat nourishes and strengthens our bodies. But then Jesus does something different. He reminds us, he says, in many ways you are what you eat, right? You consume the body of Christ, but you become then the body of Christ. We are the hands, the feet, the eyes, the ears of Jesus, reaching out with a tug, with a, with a touch, with a hug, with a casserole, a gift card, being Jesus to other people, reminders that God is with us.